My name is Ketan Gangadurkar. I'm a vice president of engineering at Indeed for job seeker products. Like everybody else who works at Indeed, I help people get jobs. And just out of curiosity, show of hands, who here has heard of Indeed? Okay. Uh, who here has used Indeed? Okay. And then how many people have found a job on Indeed? Yeah, so those numbers go progressively down. I want you to remember that. Don't feel bad if you haven't found a job on Indeed because I look at you and I think, you're my future market. I hired. You hired on Indeed. I'm the job seeker side, and so I apologize for neglecting you. So for those of you who were not familiar about Indeed, uh, what we offer is an online search where you can uh, provide keywords and a location, and we show jobs that match what you're looking for. If you're interested in something, you go a little bit deeper, you see the job description, you see some information about the company. If you like what you see, the next phase is to apply to the job, providing your contact information, some information about you to present to the employer. If the employer likes what they see, they'll invite you in for an interview, they'll get deeper into your background, get an understanding of you, your personality, and so forth. If they like what they see, they'll proceed to an offer, which defines a title, compensation, et cetera. And if you like what you see, you'll take that offer, hopefully getting to work for the best boss in the world. I saw some documentary about this guy. He seems really great. At least that's the way it works in theory. We have these great ideas. We have all of these things that we think are going to work and be great for job seekers. And then we put them out there. But how do we know if it really worked? All of these great ideas that we're so passionate about, they could fail. Right? So how do we know if it worked? Well, it's 2019. The answer is easy. Use big data. Big data has been a buzzword for a dozen years, so use big data as a large-scale web company like us. The thing is, now you have two quadrillion problems, right? Because big data is big. You're instrumenting, you're tracking events, you're logging every interaction, everything people are doing. That's a ton of data. Famous artist Pablo Picasso, he said, computers are useless. They can only give you answers. I thought this was pretty good. I thought this was pretty smart, a great insight. I thought I could actually do better than Pablo Picasso. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean this. You weren't supposed to see this. Uh, what I mean is data is useless. It can only give you answers. So what questions are you asking of your data? If you're asking bad questions, it will lead to bad science. And that's true no matter how much good data you have. Let's look at a real science, the science of chemistry. Chemistry started in alchemy, in the medieval era, the classical era. Alchemy was rules of thumb, recipes, and fantasy. Now, this could be useful, like with Greek fire, that protected the city of Constantinople for hundreds of years. Sometimes it was a little more questionable. Because they didn't understand the true science of chemistry, they thought things like turning lead into gold were possible. And they didn't really understand, so you know, now we understand that that doesn't make sense, but for all they knew back then, sure, why not? You could turn lead into gold. Now this one is a bit of a harmless example. Sometimes this was outright dangerous. In alchemy, people died all the time because they would do things like drinking pure mercury to try to cure an ailment. This is not science. Alchemy is at best a proto-science. It's incomplete, inflexible, and inexplicable. By incomplete, what they had in alchemy could not describe all of the phenomena. It was inflexible because if you had an alchemical recipe, and you tweaked it a little bit, it might work. If you tweaked it a little more, it would abruptly stop working. And it was inexplicable because when it stopped working, you wouldn't understand why. You would just notice, you would just know not to increase I of Newt by too much, otherwise your recipe would stop working. But you didn't understand why it worked when it did and why it stopped working when you adjusted it too much. I claim that we are in a similar position today Call it the alchemy of metrics, where our level of understanding is at the same level as, as medieval alchemy. We have lots of recipes, or as we call them, frameworks. 
These are things like pirate metrics, arm, heart, and game. These work. They help you draw insights, they help you improve your product, but they're frameworks that are incomplete, inexplicable, and inflexible. And these frameworks are not a science. So how do we go about creating a science out of this proto-science? First, you wanna break these recipes into their more elementary components. What are the individual elements here? Then you connect seemingly independent phenomena from different parts of the product landscape. Third, you define a holistic system to describe the interactions of these elements and the disparate phenomena. And then fourth, because we have jobs to do, you manipulate the system to achieve your goal. To go about creating a science of metrics, we have to have a couple of foundational concepts. Quality and quantity. I define quality here as an attribute, property, or characteristic of a phenomenon. Whatever it is we want to pay attention to, whatever it is we want to make happen more often. And then a unit is a count or a measure of this quality. A metric is simply a number in combination with a unit. So it could be some physical concept, like the quality of mass, which we measure in the unit of kilograms, and perhaps something has a mass of two kilograms. And that's the metric of mass. It also could be something a little bit more abstract, like engagement with a mobile uh, application or a website. And we could measure that in terms of the number of clicks, and we could describe one particular engagement as being measured in terms of six clicks. Indeed has targeted many, many metrics over the years. We've looked at searches, page views, job clicks, monthly unique visitors, job applications, daily active users, mobile app installs, job alert subscriptions, saving a job, page count, and so on and so forth. This is a lot of different metrics. Some of these metrics are particular to our industry of hiring, and then some of them are probably metrics that many of you have looked at in your products and your services. This is really, really a lot, and it's overwhelming. You can't make decisions based on all of these metrics simultaneously. So what do we measure? What do we optimize for? Well, before what comes why. Why are we measuring? What is our purpose in all of this measurement and this gathering of data? Big data is a trendy buzzword, but that's not the goal. So perhaps it is to prove what you already believe. Maybe you have great product ideas, or you're convinced you have great product ideas, and all you need to do is gather evidence to prove to other people what you already know. That can work, but I think there's a level deeper that you can go. Perhaps it is to discover what happened. You put a product experience in front of your users with a beginner's mind, without too many preconceptions, and so you discover through the exposure of your product to real users what happened, and thereby gain understanding. Another level deeper is to understand why. Sure, you see what happened, but you wanna gather data to understand why this worked and not that. I claim that each of these is wrong, or if not wrong, incomplete. I assert that the goal of data is to decide. You gather all of this information to help you make decisions in the future. Because the data that you've gathered about things that have already happened, those are things that you cannot change, right? That's the past. If your product worked or if it failed, that's done and in the past. You have to look forward. You have to look to the future and decide how to improve your product experience in the future. This is the question of how data becomes information. And I think it's pretty straightforward. The difference is that information informs action. You're gonna take action to modify your product to make it somehow better. And instead of inert data, you want information to inform those actions. Now, everyone in this room has different goals. Some of you may work in gaming, some of you may work in banking, some of you may work in can of business, which I hear is a thing now. So everyone here has different goals. And logically, we would conclude that there is no one right metric for everyone. Except I disagree with that. I think there is one right metric for everyone. And that metric is lifetime value. So I'll define lifetime value 
here as the total product benefit generated over all time. This is what you're trying to do with your product, is to maximize the total benefit for the entire time that your product exists. Let's take Indeed, for instance. If we're trying to make our products the best we can, we might be facing a choice in how to use our screen real estate. Do we want to show, show more jobs, or do we want to show more resumes? This is a tough decision to make, but if we look at it through the lens of lifetime value, which is amazing, we can clearly see that the answer is more jobs. You can also apply this to other situations. Let's say you're trying to decide at dinner tonight whether you want to have a salad or ice cream. Well, looking at it through the lens of lifetime value, the answer is easy. She chose salad based on lifetime value, and just look at how happy she is. She's going to be so much better off because of this. Now, lifetime value works for everything, every product, every service, et cetera, et cetera. And so that brings us to the end. Except I do have one question about lifetime value. How long does it take to measure lifetime value? Well, it turns out it takes a lifetime. So thank you, Manuel Job Seeker, 2018 to 2094. After 76 years, we can finally finish that A-B test. It takes a lifetime to see lifetime value. But we need to ship next week. We have sprints. We're delivering on a weekly basis. We have to make decisions based on information we have today instead of waiting to 2094 to figure out if last week's release did a good thing or not. This is where we can talk about metametrics or metrics for metrics. There are two that I really want to focus on here. One is sensitivity, which I'll describe here as how quickly and easily you can move influence a metric. Sensitivity exists on a continuum. Something with really high sensitivity is a metric that's fast and easy to change. On the other hand, a metric with low sensitivity is slow and difficult to change. Then there's correlation, which I'll define narrowly here as frequency of agreement with lifetime value. What that means is how often this metric leads you in the direction of increasing lifetime value. This also exists on a continuum. High correlation metrics usually lead toward lifetime value and rarely lead elsewhere. It might be a little bit off target, a little bit further off target, but nonetheless, you're generally headed in the right direction. The range of possible outcomes is generally constrained to things that improve your lifetime value. Something with medium correlation will generally lead you toward lifetime value, and it will occasionally lead you elsewhere. And sometimes, even when it's leading you toward lifetime value, it's not in as straight a line, but it's generally going to be helpful. And then something with low correlation. Sometimes it lead toward, leads toward lifetime value. Often it leads elsewhere sometimes in a counterproductive or highly counterproductive direction. When you have metrics with low correlation, you have no idea which way they're leading you. It could be in any direction, not just the direction of lifetime value. So correlation then exists on the low end, metrics that unpredictably lead toward lifetime value, and the high end, metrics that almost always lead toward lifetime value. We can plot these two dimensions on a graph. At the far right, we have lifetime value, which has really high correlation because it's correlating with itself, but it's really low in sensitivity because it is really hard to move and it takes a long time to see the results. And then there are a whole bunch of other metrics. Let's walk through a few of those. Let's take, for instance, a mobile app install. It's a lot easier to influence a job seeker to install our mobile app than it is to get them to increase lifetime value. But whether somebody installs the mobile app only roughly correlates with them deriving value from Indeed's service. However, it is better than saving a job. Installing a mobile app means you're more likely to gain benefit from us than saving a job. But on the other hand, saving a job has higher sensitivity. That means I can more readily influence you to save a job 
and changes that I make to my site to influence you will show up faster in my metrics. Then there's something like daily active users, which is an important metric to pay attention to, but doesn't have great sensitivity because it takes some effort to move and some effort to see the results, and it also doesn't have great correlation to lifetime value. I need activity to see lifetime value, but just because there's activity doesn't mean you're driving benefit. And then there's something like mouse pointer movement. I can do all kinds of things to make you move your mouse more on the site, like asking you to punch a monkey, but there's very low correlation between mouse pointer movement and you actually getting benefit from Indeed. And then there's something like phase of the moon, which has no sensitivity, try as I might, I haven't been able to influence the phase of the moon, and also has really low correlation. What phase the moon is says nothing about whether any job seeker is getting value. And then there's this interesting set that we see up here. This set here is best, uh, maps back to what I was talking about earlier in the flow. The search, the tap, the apply, the interview, the offer, and the hire. As you can see, the ones to the left have really high sensitivity and low correlation. The ones to the right have increasing correlation but reduced sensitivity. This is where this concept of Pareto efficiency comes in. Vilfredo Pareto lived about 100 years ago, grew a magnificent beard that I'm currently aspiring to. He was a political economist and a sociologist. He's known, among other things, for the 80-20 rule. But here, I want to talk about the concept of Pareto efficiency, which colloquially you can understand as when you can't improve one thing without making something else worse. One well-understood example of Pareto efficiency is the trade-off between reward and risk. For example, in investments. You want to have high reward in how you invest your money. But unfortunately, getting that higher reward means taking on greater risk. And if you're reluctant to take on that greater risk and you want to reduce the risk, you necessarily have to accept a lower reward. And that's the trade-off. Unfortunately, it's impossible to have any investment that is both high reward and low risk. It is possible, though not advisable, to have an investment that has both low reward and low risk. I think we call that one Bitcoin. Okay. Uh -huh. You can also apply this to other scenarios, like food. There's food that's healthy, and there's food that's delicious. It would be great if we had food that was both healthy and delicious, but that's in the impossible range. It is, of course, to have food that's neither healthy nor delicious. I think that's known as English food. <laughs> Joke goes over a lot better in Austin than it does in London for some reason. Now let's bring Pareto and introduce Pareto to sensitivity and correlation. We can draw a line right through those metrics I was talking about before. There are no metrics above this line, and that is to say there are no metrics that have both greater sensitivity and greater correlation than the metrics on this line. There are certainly metrics that have lower sensitivity and lower correlation, but if you want to do better in sensitivity than one of the metrics on this line, you have to do worse on correlation. If you want to do better on correlation, you're going to do worse on, sorry, if you want to do better on correlation, you're going to do worse on sensitivity. Search, tap, apply. You see increasing correlation, but reduced sensitivity. And then we get to interview, we get to offer, and hire. I'm getting closer and closer to seeing how I'm delivering lifetime value, but I'm also measuring phenomena that are harder and harder to influence. Of course, I would love something up here that is both super sensitive and super correlated, but it's a unicorn. It doesn't exist. I can take these metrics and collapse, collapse them into a single dimension that demonstrates that trade-off. To the left are the metrics that guide me to make faster decisions, but these are worse decisions because they correlate less with lifetime value. On the other hand, to the right, I can make decisions that are better 
because they line up better with lifetime value, but by necessity, they are slower. It takes longer to influence these metrics and longer to see the results. All right, that was pretty dry. Now it's time for some funnel. You should laugh harder at that. That's an amazing joke. <laughs> Let's look back at the user flow that we had. We go from search to tap to apply to interview to offer and then hire. We can map this as a standard product funnel. You start with somebody with a problem. I need a job. The first thing they do is they do a search. Some of them, like some of you in this audience, you do a search and you continue, but some of you stop there. And so the next stage is a narrower point. People tap, a subset of them go on to apply, subset of them then go on to interview, offer, and then get a job. As we go deeper and deeper into the funnel, we have fewer and fewer people. That's why it has this characteristic shape. And we saw that earlier with the number of people who had heard of Indeed, used Indeed, and found a job through Indeed. We can map this more generically. Somebody starts with a problem. They do the first stage of some work to solve that problem. That work produces an output, which feeds into a second stage of work. That produces an output, feeds into a third stage of work, fourth, fifth stages of work, and then for some subset of the people who started the process, we get an outcome, we get a solution to the problem that they started with. Now, you're making changes in your user flow, trying to improve the outcomes. Where do you validate the changes? Let's look at that general funnel. Let's say you're making a change to the second stage of your funnel, and you wanna evaluate whether this was a good change or a bad change. Where in your funnel do you evaluate it? Do you measure this, the output immediately following that? Or do you go further downstream, closer to your outcome, two stages down, three stages down? What about this, your final outcome? You made a change in the second stage. Where is the best place to tell whether that was actually a good change, whether it worked? We can take the two concepts of sensitivity and correlation that I described before and we can drop them in. Sensitivity increases toward the top of your funnel. That means it's easier to influence that metric and it's faster to see the results. On the other hand, your correlation improves as you go deeper and deeper to the funnel, closer to the outcome. And this represents the same trade-off that I was talking about before. Near the top of the funnel, it's really easy to see and influence what's happening. But that information has lower value in driving lifetime value. Deeper into your funnel, it's harder to influence, it's harder to measure, but you can have a lot more confidence that you're maximizing lifetime value. So when do you favor outcomes? The end of the funnel. I help people get jobs. That's the outcome that I have in mind here. You wanna favor outcomes like helping people get jobs when the change you're making is already late in the funnel, close to the outcome. You also wanna favor it when you have smaller opportunities. If you're scrounging for incremental gains because perhaps you have a mature product, the loss of correlation can be really painful to you because each win is hard earned and hard to find. So you wanna focus on outcomes there. You also wanna look at outcomes when you have time for sophisticated analysis where you can do a deep and nuanced examination of the data you have. You favor outcomes when the owner of the initiative has more influence over the outcome as opposed to owning a narrow piece. And then you also wanna favor outcomes when there's a short feedback loop between uh, each iteration of your product. Overall though, you wanna favor outcomes if you can, because that's the ultimate purpose of your product is to maximize that outcome. Sometimes you can't though. So when do you favor outputs? You wanna favor outputs when you have an exploratory product that's discovering possible outcomes. Or you can favor outputs when you have opportunities for big improvements, when there are low-hanging fruit that you can grab over and over. You might favor outputs when only simple analysis is possible, and you need to do a simple, straightforward analysis to understand whether your product is working. You favor outputs with people who have less influence over the outcome, or when you have long feedback loops between iterations of your product, and potentially also when your outcomes are hidden if you only can see part way into your funnel, then you wanna favor an intermediate output because that's the best you can do. 
Ultimately, though, you favor outputs if you must. The output is just a means to an end. And indeed, we do not say, I help people look at job descriptions, because that's not what we're there for. We're there to help people get jobs, and looking at job descriptions is just a point along the way. So that's the where. What about what to measure in your funnel? Focus on timeless needs. Your solutions are always evolving. You're steadily working on your product to make it better. But your users' needs and preferences are not. This, uh, this fellow here, a lot richer, a lot more famous than me, you may know him, Jeff Bezos, chairman, CEO, president, and ruthless cyborg killer at Amazon Inc. In an interview a few years back, he said, I very frequently get the question, what's going to change in the next 10 years? I almost never get the question, what's not going to change in the next 10 years? That second question is actually the more important of the two because you can build a business strategy around the things that are stable in time. We know that customers want low prices, and I know that's going to be true 10 years from now. They want fast delivery, they want vast selection. It's impossible to imagine a future 10 years from now where a customer comes up to me and says, Jeff, I love Amazon. I just wish the prices were a little higher. Or, I love Amazon, I just wish you'd deliver a little more slowly. You also want to choose metrics that give you many degrees of freedom. You want to choose metrics that can be improved multiple ways. If you're anything like me, your first effort will fail. You'll have this idea that you really believe in, that you think is the perfect solution to the problem, and then you'll put it in front of your users, and it will fail. You need backup plans. You need different ideas that will help you get to success. But too often I see invalid hypotheses where somebody defines the action they want to take, and then their metric is just measuring whether they took that action, not whether they solved the user's problem. So you need backup plans with the same success metrics, and your success metrics have to be able to work with those multiple plans. A better hypothesis is one where you can use the same metrics for plan A, plan B, and plan C Hopefully you won't need plan D, E, and F, but if you do, you want them to work for those as well. You also want metrics that are specific over generic. A lot of people have been here at South by Southwest all day. We're on day four. Who would like a nice flute of champagne in this audience? Anyone? Anyone? A little glass of bubbly? Okay, keep those hands up. How many of you would like a receptacle of fermented beverage? Receptacle of fermented beverage? Anyone? Anyone? That's kind of weird because isn't a flute of champagne a receptacle of fermented beverage? Yeah, that specificity really matters, doesn't it? You don't know what you're getting in that rando jar. It could make you blind for all you know. It really matters. And you also want the elegance of the champagne flute. Well, we shouldn't do the same thing with our product metrics. There are generic metrics like engagement, likes, time on site. And don't get me wrong, these things matter. They are necessary to understanding your product and how it's doing. But don't confuse necessary with sufficient. These more generic criteria are easier to satisfy. Just like it's easier for me to get you some kind of fermented beverage in some kind of receptacle than it is for me to get you a flute of champagne. More generic thus means less correlated. It's less likely to improve your lifetime outcome than something more specific. If we take a look at Indeed's search page, we've got at least three different types of engagement here. You can tap on a job title, which leads you deeper into the apply funnel. You can like a job to save it for later, or you can review a company. Do we want to consider all of this engagement equally valuable, or do we really want to focus on tapping a job title that leads you into the apply flow to get a job? I don't say I help people engage with user interfaces. I help people get jobs. When you use generic metrics, you're asking vague questions. Those vague questions will lead to useless answers and then unproductive actions. More specific is more correlated. When you do that, you're asking specific questions that lead to specific answers that guide specific actions in your product to make it better. 
Every interesting phenomenon that you're working on, that you're trying to pay attention to in your product, is going to be multi-dimensional. Let's look at this general funnel. There are different events happening in this funnel between the solution and the, uh, between the problem and the solution. Let's focus on just the apply stage. How do we understand how the apply stage is working? We have a job seeker who enters the supply stage and it produces an application to a specific job. We can measure this funnel stage along several standard dimensions. We can look at the quantity of input, how many job seekers are entering this stage of the funnel. We can also look at the quality of the input, how many of these job seekers are genuinely interested in getting a job as opposed to just browsing. We can also measure the quantity of output, how many applications are getting produced here, as well as the quality of output. How well formed are these applications? How complete are they? How well do they fit the job in question? We can measure the amount of time that it takes to go through this stage of the funnel. We can measure the amount of effort. How much does the job seeker have to do to apply to a job? We also measure the cost. How much does it cost them? How much does it cost us? And then we can also measure the happiness. How enjoyable or how miserable of a process is this? Then we've got a set of nine funnel stage dimensions that help us understand each piece of our funnel to tell if it's working well for our users. We can also take these funnel stage dimensions and apply them for the whole funnel. Quality of input, quantity of input, time to complete, effort to complete, cost, and happiness. To that, we can also add number of steps, the quantity of the outcome, and the quality of outcome, which gives us this whole array of different ways to understand the effectiveness of our funnel. We look at this and, wow, that is so many choices, isn't it? I told you I was gonna tell you what to measure, but instead I gave you even more answers to choose from. The menu is even longer. So how do you go about finding your North Star? This is a colloquialism for the one metric that guides you unerringly toward your destination. We have this funnel, and we're trying to optimize the outcome. We want to maximize the outcome quality, and we want to maximize the outcome quantity. We have to ask ourselves, where is the bottleneck? Because the funnel I showed you before is completely unrealistic. There's always going to be some bottleneck somewhere in your funnel where you have high drop-off or high loss of users, a significant reduction in success. So go looking into your funnel with the metrics I described to find that bottleneck. Perhaps you're getting too low quality beyond that stage. Perhaps it's too slow, it takes too much time. Or perhaps it's too expensive to go through that stage. There are multiple diagnoses that you can come up with based on those metrics. You make your bottleneck into your North Star. Whatever it is that is failing your users, whatever it is that's causing drop-off, reduction in quality, so forth, that bottleneck is your North Star. Now, the thing about this is there is a fault in our North Stars. This is also a killer joke. You people are ungrateful. <laughs> we think of eliminating bottlenecks as looking like this. We take this distended, deformed funnel and we turn it into a nice, clean funnel like we have at the bottom. But typically, that's not actually what happens. When we eliminate a bottleneck, the bottlenecks move. So we go from something like this to maybe a different funnel where the bottleneck is further down in the funnel. Or we go to something like this where we've discovered a new bottleneck higher up in the funnel. Or sometimes we end up with two bottlenecks in our funnel. But bottlenecks move, they don't get eliminated. There's always going to be something that's reducing the chance that your users are gonna reach their success. You end up playing whack-a-mole. You hit one bottleneck and another one pops up. You hit that one and another one pops up. There's a certain irony in this, right? Because I told you I was gonna describe the North Star, the one unerring guide to maximizing your success. Well, it turns out this analogy is more apt than it seemed. It's not actually a contradiction because the true North Star isn't what we think. The North Star today is Polaris, but it turns out that's not a cosmic truth. There's something that happens called the precession of the equinoxes, 
over a 26,000 year cycle, the North Star actually changes. In 4,000 years, it's gonna be a different star called Gamma Cephei. 3,000 years after that, another star called Alderaman, and then Deneb. Your North Star, just like the real North Star, will move over time as you address your bottlenecks. Finding your new North Star, you look at the need, the outcome you're trying to satisfy, the bottleneck in your ability to do it, a diagnosis, you generate a hypothesis, and then you take action. Your North Star, for now, is going to be the bottleneck in this flow and the diagnosis of that bottleneck. We also want to talk about how many metrics you should use. Different metrics are going to deviate from truth in different ways. Let's take the metric of red to illustrate this. You can get good and useful information from red, right? But you're also missing a lot from the red. We can look instead at green, which gives us information that was lacking from red, but it also loses some of the information that we had. Let's look at blue instead. Again, blue is deviating from the reality. We're missing information, but we're also gaining information we didn't have from red and green. What we can do, of course, is we can combine them, and we can get a rich photograph of the reality. We can combine these multiple metrics to reduce deviation. Oh wait, and we gotta slap a beard on this guy, because that's what he looks like now. Too many metrics will restrict your movement. Let's say you're looking at exactly one metric to determine success. All else being equal, there's a 50% chance that any change will improve that metric. If you're looking at two metrics and you want both of them to improve simultaneously, you're down to a 25% chance, all else being equal, that you'll improve both of them simultaneously. With three metrics, it goes down to 12.5%, and four metrics, your chance of improvement with all four of them simultaneously is down to a paltry six and a quarter percent. You can look at this as a plot between freedom and number of metrics. As you increase the number of metrics, your degrees of freedom in your product go down and down and down because it's harder and harder to improve all of them simultaneously. We have to balance this against a different concept though, and that of marginal information gain. That is to say, every metric you add to your product should significantly improve the quality of your decisions. It should bring information that better informs your actions. We can also plot that against the number of metrics. Your first metric, your first two metrics, they give you a wealth of information. Your second and third and fourth metrics, they still give you useful insights, but maybe not as much as the first two, relatively speaking. As you add more and more metrics, you get diminishing returns. Certainly you're learning from them and you're gaining more insight, but the amount of insight you gain for each added metric becomes less and less and less. You can illustrate the trade-off between these two scenarios. As you increase the number of metrics, your information increases, but your degrees of freedom reduce. As a good rule of thumb, a one size fits most, try to target three to four independent metrics when optimizing your product. Fewer than that, and you may overlook important phenomena. More than that, and it gets harder and harder to improve things while all of your metrics are positive. You can also use these metrics for better prediction with mental models before you even measure anything, before you have a product out there. The measure of a metric is its utility, not its truth or accuracy or meaning. I'm in a lot of conversations where people talk about what the truer metric is, but what's most important is what it helps you think about and helps you optimize for. You wanna focus on what optimizing the metric does for your product, not any kind of deeper aesthetic purpose. This comes into play with thought experiments, the most famous of which is, of course, the quantum physics thought experiment involving Schrodinger's unfortunate cat. You wanna ask, which actions improve my metric? And you also wanna ask which actions degrade my metric. Let's look at a specific scenario in Indeed's job flow. Let's say we think we want to improve the metric of phone screens, which happens between the apply and interview stages. If we're optimizing for phone screens, we wanna ask what it encourages and what it discourages. 
What it encourages is broad attention across many jobs because employers have a limited capacity to do phone screens and so do job seekers. If we spread that attention more widely, we can enable more phone screens. It discourages many applications to fewer jobs because each employer only has so much time and stamina for phone screens, and the same is true of job seekers. It also encourages deeper engagement. It's pretty far down in the funnel. So somebody who's just browsing to see what's available, we're not gonna be optimizing for them. We're gonna be optimizing for people who are deeply engaged in their job search. And it discourages that insincere activity. People who might look and click and maybe even apply, but aren't seriously looking for a new job. It encourages selective targeting of jobs. It encourages us to put the right job in front of the right job seeker because they have to get pretty far down, both in their level of interest and the reciprocal interest from the employer in order to get a phone screen. So we have to be selective in what we show to which job seeker. And it discourages, discourages indiscriminate targeting of jobs where we put any job in front of anybody. Then we have to ask ourselves, is this what we want? Do these actions line up with our goals and our strategies? Now, you may go through this exercise and identify similar options. Say, for instance, volume, which is the total number of phone screens in all of Indeed's ecosystem, and coverage, the number of job seekers who have a phone screen. Let's look at some specific scenarios. In the first scenario, we have one job seeker who experiences five phone screens. That counts as a volume of five, but a coverage of only one, because it's only one job seeker. Second scenario, we also have a volume of five. We have one job seeker with one phone screen, a second with three, and a third with only one. Our coverage, though, is considerably better. Volume is the same, coverage improves to three. And then in the third scenario, we have four job seekers, each of whom experiences one phone screen, and a fifth job seeker who does not. This is actually worse from a volume perspective, but it's better from a coverage perspective. It's all the way up to four. This helps us understand where do they diverge. These are both measures of phone screens, but the nuances and our thought experiments identification of these nuances helps us make better decisions. We have to decide whether we want to be good for more job seekers or we want to be better for fewer job seekers. This is a choice. This is not something that comes out of the data. This is something that's our strategy informed in our metrics. And fundamentally, that's what it comes down to. Metrics are strategy. Your choice of metrics defines your problem that you're trying to solve. If you don't measure it, it doesn't matter to you. It's not part of your problem space, and that's why you're ignoring it. And you are going to get what you measure. You're gonna tell people, optimize this metric, and what you're saying is, I favor the actions that lead to this improving. I claim that every story of metrics misuse is really a story of badly chosen metrics. Often people claim the fault is with using metrics at all, but I think they used the wrong metrics. And we're not immune to that. We once increased job clicks by blasting more emails. This was just from one job seeker. And if you look, they got one email day after day after day. And certainly this metric improved one metric, number of job clicks, but it increased frustration and it certainly didn't increase the number of people getting jobs. In this situation, we had a bad choice of metrics, which led us to the wrong problem, which is how many emails people were getting instead of how many jobs they were getting. And so we had an ineffective, maybe even counterproductive solution. And awesome data can't fix that. You will never find strategy in your data. You have to bring your own strategy and then measure it using the data, optimize it using the data. But it's not gonna be discovered in the data. So how do we go about solving problems with science? Our goal is increasing lifetime value. That starts with an action which addresses a bottleneck, which improves an output, which improves an outcome, which taps into some persistent need of your customers and maximizes their lifetime value. Here are six things to try in your next product meeting. Number one, estimate sensitivity and correlation for the metrics that you're already using. 
You could get really scientific about this, but generally you can estimate it reasonably well, and that can be useful enough. Then find your Pareto frontier. Find the metrics that show the best trade-off between sensitivity and correlation. Third, map your funnel and apply the standard metrics to the funnel stages and the funnel as a whole. Fourth, trade off outputs and outcomes, balancing them against each other for actionability, but also correlation with the lifetime value you're trying to drive. Fifth, target roughly three to four independent metrics to be your North Stars to optimize the bottleneck that you currently face. And then six, after deciding what you might want to target, run thought experiments. Think through what behaviors this encourages and what behaviors this discourages, and see if they line up with your gut and with your strategy. That's the end, for real this time. So this is scheduled to go until 5.30. I know many of you have places to go, people to see, and we started late. I appreciate you coming, and I'm happy to entertain questions for a few minutes. I also want to uh, put up some information. Um, if you want to email me, you can email me at kathan at scienceofmetrics.com. Um, ask questions, consult more deeply. Um, there's a video of version one of this talk from May of last year. This version, I think, is seven to 8% better, but there's an earlier version on YouTube. And then, of course, if you want to learn more about Indeed Engineering and Product, you can visit our blog at the URL above. Um, if you do want to ask questions, there's a microphone available here, but you certainly won't hurt my feelings if you want to get off to happy hour. Can you share, uh, I'm Saurabh Chen from India. Can you share some good books on these things? Can I share good books on metrics? Yeah, so this content is a combination of things that I've read and my own experiences um, so some of this is relatively original. Um, I do like, uh, there's one called How to Measure Anything um, by, I believe the author's last name is Hubbard. Um, there's also an O'Reilly book called Lean Analytics, which has a lot of good specific. Lean, lean Analytics? Lean Analytics. Um, it doesn't try to kind of draw a big picture view, but it has a lot of specific things. Um, those are the two that come to mind offhand. The first one was how to measure anything. How to measure anything, yes. Oh, oh. Hi. So my question is you kept defining independent metrics. Can you define independent a little better, like in, given some context? Yes. Sorry, uh, sorry if I skipped over that too hastily. Um, what I think of it, independent is it's basically the same as the statistical definition, okay. meaning they tend not to share the underlying cause, um, and so they are more likely... Uh, so they're not correlated with one another? They're not correlated with another, one another or some underlying shared cause. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Hey, <clears throat> I appreciate the talk. I uh, like your uh, presentation cadence, by the way. Oh, thank you. Um, so how do you guys think about the uh, con conflicting interests between the speed of response for a job posting and then the quality of the candidates that come through? Because when there's a lot of uh, applicants, it's going to be prioritizing the early responders. And so therefore, it's almost the flow would be respond really quickly then look into the company rather than identify over a longer arc the companies that fit um, the direction, the path that you're looking to take your career? Yeah, um, that's a good question. Um, in our examination of the data, as long as the, app, as long as the job is not flooded with applicants, it turns out there's only a slight correlation between when you apply and whether you actually get the job. Yeah. Employers are really looking for the right candidate and as long as they're not inundated with candidates, you don't really get an advantage by being early. So um, companies that are more popular are going to get a larger uh, applicant response. And so how do you help them sort of sift? Is there sort of a ranking system, like uh, some weighted vector that you use to determine like how it's coming through? Or is it just chronological? 
Uh, yes, there is, there is a ranking system. We have, um, we've been basically optimizing ranking for pretty much the entire period we've existed. So it's not, it's not just a simple keyword match. There are a ton of factors applied by people way smarter than me into ranking. We have dozens and dozens of people working on it from a data science, software engineering, human curation. Um, it's actually probably considerably more than dozens. I think if we add them up, we might be, might be as many as 100. Um, working in these areas, just trying to identify jobs that are high quality jobs, especially to avoid scams, uh, and then better understanding at, at a very deep level the different nuances of jobs, the different nuances of how people query, um, sincerity of intent. Um, it's a huge, huge field and one of our most important focuses. Thank you. So I was curious on your thoughts on culling the data itself, right? So there's abundance of data, and then you're very judicious about the process in terms of metrics and such. But uh, it could be that the, the, the initial data set itself has, is polluted in some way, and no matter what analyses you're doing, it's kind of leading you wayward, or you're, you're still doing the analysis to exclude that data, but it could have been just culled from the get-go. Uh, it may not apply to your specific situation, but I was asking in general in terms of analysis. Yeah, um, I don't know that I could speak with authority on how to curate and clean a data set. Um, that's probably, there are probably better people to describe that than me. I would, I would just be talking out of my ass, really. How do you consider the negative impact on lifetime value of failures as you go farther and farther down uh, the path from left to right, from clicking on a job to applying to the job? That's a, that's a great question, um, because there's, a, there's actually a reduction in a job seeker's perception if they apply to a job and then fail to get it. Is that what you're referring to? Yes, and there's just an investment in time in the concept of, right. you know, I've gone through all these steps and then now I don't get it. And so the negative impact on value goes up the farther I get through that process if I fail. Yeah. There's, a, there's another talk I'm working on that hits exactly this point. It's, it's not in this one, but basically the idea is the ideal funnel is one that looks like this mm -hmm. um, because uh, you have maximum drop off in the first stage because if you go almost all the way to the end and then fail, it's exactly the wasted effort and energy that you're talking about. Right. Um, I think, you know, Indeed has been a really successful company. I'm proud to work there. Um, we have done really well by making the process suck a little less. Um, but looking for a job and getting a job is still difficult. And one of the benefits from that is that people appreciate and understand that it is going to be a challenge. People know that they're not going to get the best job on the first try. We would like that to happen eventually. But I think one of the things we benefit from here is the understanding of our job seekers that finding the right job for them does take a substantial amount of work, and there are going to be setbacks and failures along the way. I would absolutely like our product to do better than that, but at least you know where we are today, we benefit greatly from our job seekers understanding that this is difficult, and it's better than it used to be, even though there's still a long, long way to go.